Hello, welcome, welcome. Okay, people are rolling in. Hello, good evening, everyone. We hope you enjoyed the show. We're so excited that you're here. Just waiting for people to come on in, get settled. Okay. Great. Hello, everyone. Hello. Welcome, welcome, welcome. Good evening. We hope you enjoyed She Persisted. Uh, my name is Melissa Mahoney. I am an actor and a proud teaching artist here at the Atlantic Acting School. Uh, I'm also a proud alum, not only of the school, but of a few Atlantic for Kids productions as well. So I'm very, 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 very excited to be the sort of MC for this evening's um, talk back for the virtual production of She Persisted the Musical. Um, we're gonna get started in just a minute. I'm, I'm seeing that people are still trickling in. So I'm just gonna do some housekeeping before we get started. Uh, I'll give you a sort of rundown of how the event is going to run. Um, firstly, this is live. Woo, so exciting. Um, so just a reminder that we are reliant on the internet for this event. And if any troubleshooting needs to happen, we will work through it as quickly and as smoothly as possible. Um, that being said, if you experience any technical difficulties and need assistance, you can use the Q&A function in Zoom. It's right on the bottom there um, and you can just if give us a chat if you need help with anything and hopefully we can work through any problems as smoothly and as quickly as possible. Um, so uh, as some of you may know, last March, Atlantic for Kids produced the New York premiere of She Persisted, the musical, on the stage at the Linda Gross Theater, but the production was um, sadly cut short due to the COVID-19 pandemic. However, that same team, against all odds, decided to come together and sort of uh, reimagine a virtual version of the show that you all just watched, which is so incredible and inspiring. So we're in for such a special treat tonight um, because the artists have gathered and they're here to talk with all of you and with each other about their experience um, working on the show and with this story. Um, so it's really, really, really exciting. Um, there's also gonna be a chance for audience members if you have questions for the creative team, for the actors, you can put your questions in the Q&A and we'll have time at the end to sort of go through some of those questions. Um, and then um, we'll have a chance to sort of turn on our videos if we so choose and I'll be leading us in a very fun activity. We'll get up on our feet and do a little dancing, a little games. Um, so that'll happen at six and we'll say our goodbyes at 6.15. Uh, great, so without further ado, I'm going to introduce our artists, starting with Chelsea Clinton, author of several books for young readers, including the New York Times bestsellers, She Persisted, uh, she Persisted 13 American Women Who Changed the World, as well as She Persisted Around the World, and most recently, She Persisted in Sports. Welcome, Chelsea. And MK Lawson. MK is the director and choreographer of the stage and virtual productions of She Persisted and longtime friend and collaborator of The Atlantic, having worked on six other projects for Atlantic for Kids. Welcome, MK. And we have the entire cast of She Persisted. We have Aubert Bercy, Jancy Colin Soto, Amanda Corday, Amber Janae, Cynthia Nesbitt, and Heather Sawyer. Welcome, cast. Um, okay, MK, I'm going to throw it over to you. Thanks, Melissa. I, this smile always gets on my face when I'm in the room with these women, this cast, even if it's a Zoom room. <laughs> and obviously, it is such an honor for all of us also to be here with you, Chelsea, and just filled with gratitude that you even created this book that could then be created into a musical that could then turn into a Zoom production, a virtual production, that now we get to share an experience with everybody at home or everybody at home watching. And I just wanted to start us off by saying I'm so grateful to everyone who watched the production, who shared it with their family, with their kids, with the uh, young people in their lives, and that I'm grateful that you came back to hear us talk a little bit more about it and that hopefully we can uh, teach you something you might not have known about the piece or um, about one of the actors or about how it came to how it came to be. Uh, I thought I would kick things off by asking you Chelsea and I didn't want to take for granted that people how much people might have known about the book the source material of our musical. Um, so I thought I'd start by asking you to tell us a little bit about what inspired the book uh, and what, if any, 
thing has maybe taken on new meaning uh, in the years since the book was published. Well, thank you, uh, MK, and uh, it is just a, a joy for me to be in virtual space with all of you. Um, you know, there are many reasons uh, She Persisted is uh, so uh, deeply meaningful uh, to me, and uh, you know, also the the musical exists in this almost uh, kind of mythological place in our family's history because it was the last thing we did <laughs> before the world shut down. It was the last kind of live arts experience. I think it was the last kind of public experience um, that our kids had uh, before the world um, for the world shut down. Um, and you know, MK, I have I have thought and uh, kind of always think, but have thought a lot about the women who most inspire me over recent days. You know, I wrote uh, She Persisted um, in early 2017, you know, partly in reaction to uh, Senator Warren uh, attempting to read uh, Coretta Scott King's uh, letter about the nomination of Jeff Sessions at the time, 30 years before the federal bench in which she outlined uh, his quite painful history of racism. And Senator Warren was you know, trying to read this letter into the, into the record uh, during the debate as to whether or not Jeff Sessions should be considered worthy to be our attorney general. And she was making the point that if someone had ultimately been considered to be too racist in 1986 to be a federal judge, which had been ultimately the decision of the Reagan administration when they withdrew his nomination, um, that presumably he hopefully would still be considered too racist for any kind of federal um, kind of judiciary or legal appointment, uh, including the attorney uh, general. And unfortunately, uh, you know, clearly her Republican colleagues didn't agree with her, uh, and they also um, didn't agree that it was important to listen to uh, to Mrs. King, who was an extraordinary civil rights leader in her own right. I think too often Coretta Scott King is kind of treated as a footnote in our history, um, but she actually was a really important civil rights leader um, in in her community, kind of on her on her school campus um, when she met uh, the young. Uh, future uh, Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Um, and, you know, so as I was just kind of in enmeshed in the news MK in kind of January, and I was just thinking about kind of how, how kind of persistent and, and gutsy and admirable I thought Senator Warren was and kind of what and how, you know, she was standing up for what she thought was right, standing up against kind of, um, Republicans who wanted to silence her. And I was thinking about Mrs. King and how kind of she stood up kind of her whole life um, for what is right. I was also just thinking about how often the story of our country um, kind of politically, artistically, kind of in sciences and sports has, has been the story of, of women persisting. And I wanted to share those inspiring stories with with young readers, including at the time my my two kids and now and now my three kids. And um, and I just love seeing, you know, my sons look up to strong women and they just sort of expect to have women role models. Like, why would they not? So it's a longer answer than I meant to give MK, but that's kind of why I wrote the book and why I've been thinking a lot recently about these women, because uh, we need a lot of people to stand up for what's right right now and to stand up against what's wrong. Absolutely. I wonder if anyone saw the news that um, amidst a very tumultuous end of the year this year, that there is a national, the, Smith, Miss, the, the, the Smithsonian, say that five times fast, the Smithsonian uh, is that, that we're putting money as a country into making a national museum of, of women in history. And I wondered, Chelsea, if you felt like, did I sort of manifest this thing? It's like, because it hasn't existed oh. and one of the, just one of the joys of the book is that you set it in a museum, you set it in a place where we get to go and ha and touch, like be the touchstone, like we the reader get to be the touchstone. Um, like, like we, we interact with the women, the way the book is written. And I just felt like that was an exciting development this year. Uh, no, I think um, we need good news right now. You know, the, that, uh, Smithsonian Museum or kind of the future Smithsonian Museum has been you know, a project, you know, truly of decades, uh, MK and decades of women and thankfully some men, you know, kind of pushing forward 
And I'm really um, excited that at least now there's the commitment to make it happen. Um, but of course it took far too long um, and kind of so many of us had to argue like you know, far too uh, persistently uh, that, that we needed a museum. Uh, but I'm glad, I'm glad that we will have one. I think one of my favorite things about the piece once it was adapted from the book to the stage is that we have, we had now, we have now this heroine, Naomi, who, who goes on a journey, I like to say essentially to, to shift her, her idea of success from perfection to persistence and uh and to really grapple with with the what the difference of those two things and i thought it'd be fun to do a quick round robin of the room and just find out what of of all the important messages i think what's so cool is naomi needs something different from every woman she meets in in the story uh what if we do a quick round robin of everyone's favorite message maybe the one that as, even as an adult you still need from time to time. Who am I going first? I would just realize it was, <laughs> I was, I was like, who? yeah, Chelsea, go first. Sorry, I just because I was unmuted and I saw everyone else was still muted. I didn't want to be like presumptuous, but I was like, I think I'm the only one who doesn't have like a, a red microphone with a slash through it. You know, okay, I think um, you know, I love like every second um of of the musical. And um, and I think part of the reason I do love every second is it, it clearly is about uh, persistence. And I think it's also really in a profound way about um, kind of curiosity and community and empathy, you know, that kind of she can feel connected to these different women's stories. She can feel um, kind of in, in community, I think, with these women while she's also feeling hopefully in a, in a good sense, um, inspired and not intimidated. That's like way more words, you asked for one. You know, I I also just think um, it's really important that she feels like she could be any of these women in her own way, right? That that all of these are, are possible futures for her. Um, and that certainly, um, you know, that's, that's what I want like for, for my own kids and for every, and for every kid, so. That was not one word, but that's all <laughs> of what I word or fra like <laughs> phrase, theme, message. Um, Amber, why, why don't we uh, hit you next, Naomi herself? Hey, so I was trying to think, you know, when you asked the question, I was like, oh, what should I say? Like, there's so many amazing women that we cover in the story, but it was, it was really hard to pick one person and with that, as I was going through each of the women, I was like, wait, they all have this common theme of having this talent or having this knowledge or something important about them. And they're being silenced, right? And they're all persevering. They're also going after it. And one thing with Naomi is she kind of silences herself. You know, there isn't anybody in the story necessarily that silences her, you know, she puts it out there, she projects all this negativity onto herself. And then she meets all these amazing women who, despite everything else that all these other people, all these external factors are telling, telling them, they still go after it. And I think that's something I have to remind myself all the time where it's just like, Ignore the external factors, but also ignore the internal factors that are trying to bring me down, trying to be negative and trying to put all this negative energy that isn't even out there and projecting it into the world and focusing on what's important to me and what my purpose is, my knowledge, my talent is, and sharing it despite what anybody says or whatever that negative thought in my head is saying too. So yeah. <laughs> Heather. I think what was really interesting for me playing against Naomi is like time in Naomi's relationship of discovering that they themselves are enough despite every little internal thing that fights against them and that they are able to connect with people despite the timeline where they are, when they are, 
who they are, what they look like, or what they may be experiencing, there's something for them to find and value in each person's story that will help them value themselves. Chancy. Hello. Um, so I'm going to be like super cheesy right now and I want nobody to laugh at me, but I really believe in just the whole find another solution concept. Um, ever since I was a little kid, I was so prominently curious. Um, I remember like watching scary movies the few times that it happened and my instinct was never like, oh God, this is scary, but like, what is this creature? What is this monster? I want to know what it is. I want to figure it out. So, um, coming from a place where curiosity is how I lead in life and having something like find another solution, you know, inspired by Justice Sotomayor um, has really helped me change my life in a way because it's such a direct application of the concept that nothing can stop you if you're always looking for another way to make it succeed. Um, and I've literally applied this to everything in my life since doing the show. Everything from like baking, I tried to make macaroons and like I had made the batter too thick. So they weren't macaroons anymore, but they were meringues and they still tasted great. So like that is seriously just like part of my life now. I do it when I'm playing video games, like, oh, I can't beat this boss. I gotta get more ammo. Like anything, it applies to everything. So that for me is so exciting, feeling like I never have to be fully defeated. I can always think my way, try my way, practice my way around it. And I think that's so much fun and it keeps life interesting and it helps me not to feel so defeated, especially in times when it can be really easy to feel like everything's falling down around you. Cynthia. Hey. Um, I take so many lessons from the show in my daily life. Like I think back to the songs and the messages in the show almost on a daily basis, especially as it's been percolating over the, sum the summer and the project that we built. But in this moment, what's coming back to me is the moment in the show where Naomi meets Harriet Tubman and uh, asked her how and why she keeps moving forward and how she could dare. And her response is, how can I not? And that's what's coming to me in this moment. I am someone who likes to think my way around a project and think and think and think before I take a step. And I um, have decided to commit to more action, to being more action oriented. And it's, it's simple questions like, I see something is wrong. I see something needs my help. I see something needs to be different. There is no, there is no choice but to act and to move forward in the spirit of empathy and um, truth and, um, and hope. So that's what I'm moving forward with today. Is, yeah. Auburn. I was thinking about it when you asked the question and the first thing that came to my mind actually was Flojo. Um, Cause I just love her whole, her whole story of being like so unapologetically herself. Um, even when people were telling her not to and, and the fact that she got second place instead of first, like all of these, like what she would consider setbacks um, and learning from that is so hard. Um, and I feel like every one of us can relate to that, especially after this past year that we've all had, like we can definitely relate to like getting knocked down, but like moving forward and like getting yourself up again. So, yeah. I actually think the moment that Flojo says, if you're not your number one fan, who will be? Might, might top, it's my top three of, of the show. Amanda, we want to round out our round robin. Hi. The first thing that comes to mind for me is um, a lot of things, but uh, but especially Sally Ride's um, quote, you can't be what you can't see, in that a lot of these women didn't have role models or examples to look up to, because for Sally, there weren't women in space. For Dr. Apgar, there weren't certainly not women in positions of power in hospitals. The, for Sonia, there wasn't a female justice in the Supreme Court, and they took it upon themselves to be the one who set the example and I think I try to remember that in my 
daily life that I can take up that space and I can look up to people, but also set an example for myself and for others and that it's okay to take up space. I think as humans and as women in particular, we're often told to take up less space and not do all the things that we feel like we can do or want to do. And these women remind me to take up space and that uh, I can be whatever I, I want to be. And sometimes you have to be the one who does it first. That, all those answers, I feel like were resonant and beautiful. And I just wanted to add for myself, as I was listening to all of you, I was, I'm reminded of how much even working on this production live in, in an area I know very well, theater, and then working in a completely unknown, the Zoom musical, um, I am reminded how Naomi learns that it's okay to make mistakes and how, how important, I feel like as an adult, how that message for me is, um, if it's okay with me that I make mistakes, that means I love myself enough. And probably that means I'm going to develop a love and enough space for other people too, when they make mistakes. And um, I love that message of the show so much. And I hope that one resonates through all of, all of time. And speaking of time, I always expect Heather to throw a handful of confetti. Uh, uh, if no one stops me, Chelsea, I might punt one more question towards you, which is, what guided you in choosing these 13 women? And could we, I got, I got my sister a copy of She Persisted in Sports for Christmas. She is an adult, but she works at ESPN and I'm so proud of her. And uh, I wonder if we can hope for more under the umbrella of She Persisted so we can keep learning and reminding ourselves. Because I can imagine it was hard to choose just 13. Yes. Yeah, so the first book was really personal to me. I mean, I, I feel deeply connected to all of these women. Um, you know, even when you were talking about Flojo, like I remember being a little girl in Little Rock, Arkansas and watching the Olympics. Um, it was the one time my parents let me watch like unlimited television. And I remember back when the Olympics were like only 16 days and I watched like as much television as I could over those like 16 days of glory. And I, I don't think I can really articulate how profound of an impact it had on me watching Flo Jo win and watching her win so unapologetically, right? Like when you talk about like taking up space, that like she took up that space and like she won and she was so proud and she just expected us to be proud with her and, and for her. And that felt so both natural to me and also a little bit um, surprising because I hadn't seen women really do that very much. And, and so I just like seeing her win, seeing her obliterate the Olympic records, the world records, you know, had such a big impact on me. And, um, and I remember, you know, my, my grandmother teaching me about Helen Keller and my mom talking to me about Harriet Tubman. And so these, so many of these women were so just formative to, the stories that I valued and that I thought were valuable and I thought were important. And then, you know, the, the person I learned about much later in life was actually Dr. Apgar, who I learned about when I was pregnant for the first time with, with our oldest daughter, Charlotte, and my wonderful OBGYN was telling me like, and, you know, hopefully you'll have a healthy delivery. And the first thing that we'll do is like perform the Apgar score. And I was like, what's that? And I just thought like, I have a master's degree in public health. Like how, from Columbia, nonetheless, like where, where Dr. Apgar, like, you know, worked for so many years. Like, I was like, how did I not know about this extraordinary woman who arguably developed like the most common test in the world? Like there have been billions and billions of children that have been born like all over the world who was like first test in life is like the Apgar test. So, you know, MK, the, this, these were all just such personal stories to me. And then she persisted around the world. Um, I knew there were some stories I really wanted to include, like Wangari Matai, who I just kind of fell in love with as a, as a young kid, whose first real connection to activism was like through the environment and trying to raise awareness about climate change. But I also knew there were lots of stories I didn't know. So I asked for 
just suggestions from friends, friends of friends, from editors and authors across the global Penguin Random House family. She persisted in sports, had a similar story. And I am very excited to say I'm working on my fourth picture book, um, which I can't talk about yet, but um, but, but will be out in the world um, early next year, hopefully. We have a few amazing, we have a lot of amazing questions from our audience. Um, I'm gonna throw, we were getting a few questions about the, the challenges and MK, you kind of touched on this of moving from the stage to the virtual stage. Um, what was like, what were some of the challenges either from the actors or from the director? Like what, what was maybe like the biggest challenge? I will jump in quickly just to say, for me, as a, I've been a theater practitioner my whole life, a theater, I've not dealt in the digital medium at all. And so I felt like my whole process was sort of inverted and pulled back in and completely thrown a loop. I was having to make decisions. I, my cast knows this very much, like throwing spaghetti at the wall. Let's see what sticks, who knows? Like this could be anything, it could be nothing, it could be everything, let's explore. and. And the, the cyber space, the cyber creation is a little bit different from that. And certain decisions, just to be a good collaborator, you had to make more quickly or, or sooner, earlier in the process than I was used to making them. So it was a real, like, I do have to say, Sonia Sotomayor was our guiding light. It was like, find another solution. And when problems came up, you just stayed flexible and curious because we were all in this sort of new medium together. Amber, you wanna to add to that? <laughs> yeah, sure. Um, I have to admit when I got that uh, email saying we were coming back, I was so nervous. It just seemed like such a huge daunting task. Um, we hadn't seen each other in months. We hadn't visited the show in months. We went from performing <laughs> almost twice a day to nothing at all. And we didn't really have a lot of rehearsals leading up to filming. So it was just kind of like, you got to jump back in it and be ready for it. And really everybody showed up and showed out, which was exciting. We had to figure out eye lines, you know, we're in front of a green screen and we have our lights all around us and we have our, you know, camera in front of us and we have to deal with the microphone and you're being all these different people all at once. You have all these different hats on all at once. Um, but we made it work and it turned out really cool, I think. Uh, yeah, it was fun. <laughs> um, great, we have a question about, um, I've lost it, where did it go? Uh, who is a strong female role model that inspires you most in life? And everyone can answer, just give a quick answer. I have an easy answer. My mom is my person. She inspires me the most because of all that she's done in her life. Immigrant woman coming here. She's like the person that I look up to the most. Me too. My mom and my grandmother. Same. <laughs> I think it's hard to be mom, mom and grandmother grandmothers and the football job yeah it's a hard job definitely my mom but definitely my grandma the matriarch without a doubt <laughs> without a doubt it's so funny to hear everybody say this because I thought I was going to be the only person with this answer I was like everybody's going to have some cool world shaker Nobel prize winner no it's my grandmother and my mom every anybody who knows me knows how I feel about those two women I love you and they're watching, so I love you very much. And Chelsea think, knows how much I love you. <laughs> I think uh, my grandmother too, when I think of, when I think of strength, I think of it in terms of feminine qualities. I think my grandmother is one of the strongest women I've ever met. She's lost children. She's lost uh, loved lovers, loved ones, you know, my grandfather, she's, and she's so great, been so graceful and kind. She's like an angel on earth. Um, this is also 
I mean, there's so many good questions. I just want to shout out to our audience who are making, it's making it very hard for me to choose ones, but I'm going to try to sort of solidify a couple and put them into one question, which is, um, what is some advice that you would give um, to maybe a young, a young woman, a girl? Um, we sort of touched on it earlier about the sort of like the, our favorite themes from the show, but like there was, if we were taking like a Naomi in our own lives, um, who's maybe feeling anxious or overwhelmed or like they have to be this and that perfect. Um, what's like one piece of advice that you would give a young person in your life who's struggling in that way? I think I would say it's always absolutely okay and necessary to feel exactly how you're feeling and never be ashamed of that. And, and if you can feel the way you're feeling, it will pass. It is a thing that's transient. It's a thing that passes. And I would encourage them that when they feel bad, that it's okay. And when they're scared, it's okay. That's, I guess I'm thinking in terms of right this minute too. And my nephews, that's, that's what I want to tell them always. I mean, I, I will speak as a parent um, and, you know, certainly, I mean, our, our youngest son, Jasper, has lived uh, well more than half of his life now, kind of in this COVID era. I look at him and I'm like, hopefully you're gonna have friends in 2022. <laughs> I'm like, it's gonna be great when you have them. <laughs> um, and thankfully his older siblings uh, love him and are, and are very good, uh, very good big brother and big sister. You know, but for our older kids, as I'm sure kind of many of the parents, grandparents, older siblings, um, kids themselves, uh, most importantly, you know, this, this is a really hard time. You know, my, you know, my children, like I'm sure many of the kids watching, you know, go to school, at least partly, you know, virtually when they get to go into a classroom, right? They wear masks, they sit, you know, eight feet away. Um, sometimes I'll ask like Charlotte or Aiden, our older kids, like when they're able to be kind of in person, like how was school today? They're like, mom, I wore my mask the whole time. Right. You're like, oh my God, like that. They, I'm so glad that you're proud. And like my public health heart is like deeply warmed and my maternal heart breaks. Right. And they're like, you know, and I kept my distance. Right. Like I didn't touch anyone. And I'm like, that's great. And also heartbreaking. So I just think like we're all feeling so much right now. And I think, you know, to just build on what MK was saying, not only is it valid, um, you know, I, I want to hear it, right? The the adults in your life, those of us who are blessed to, to love you, small creatures, like want to hear what you're feeling and want to be here to help, help support you kind of, as MK said, navigate through those feelings. And they're all valid and they're all real. And, you know, we adults have them too. And then maybe this will be our final question. Um, uh, this is for Chelsea and then a sort of uh, follow-up or mirrored question for the cast. Um, Chelsea, what did you want people to feel after they read the book? And MK and cast, what did you hope or what did you want people to feel after they saw the show? Well, I, I wanted people to feel um, inspired and hopeful um, because I think, you know, we always... Um, you know, we need hope because because hope fundamentally is the belief that that tomorrow can be better, and it's okay if hope comes from a place of anger, um, or if it comes from a place of kind of deep understanding of kind of what what can and and should be different and how it could be different, or if it just comes from a place of like this doesn't feel right and and I want something to be to be different or to or to be better or hopefully to be both. Um, so, you know, I really, I hope uh, that people uh, are as inspired by these women as I am, uh, but I really hope that after reading the book uh, or watching the show or hopefully both, uh, that, that people feel, people feel uh, hopeful and then a responsibility to manifest that hope in their lives. I guess I'll just say really fast, um, after doing the show, particularly the stage version, but this translates as well to the virtual version, um, 
I think about Walk On and sort of what a powerhouse finale that really is. And that's, you know, totally credit to Adam and Deborah for writing such an amazing song. Um, I really want people to feel fired up. Like we, we put this whole story together and we told it with our full hearts and we put our everything into it. And then we end with these amazing harmonies and, you know, this, this choreography or, or just this blocking and, the vision that MK put into it. Um, and I feel like we all did our best to sort of channel that. Um, and I want people to take away from that a feeling of just invigoration and, you know, a sense of, I am now actively supported by all these women that I just watched perform this and I'm gonna channel their power to go accomplish everything I've ever wanted. That's kind of the vibe I was myself infusing into that performance. Yes, yes. Totally yes. backing off of that. Solid. Uh, Similarly, it makes me think of the moment in Walk On when MK really encouraged us to break the fourth wall mm -hmm. and really look at the kids um, in the stage version or in like the virtual version to feel the presence of the other little singers and little persisters with us. Mm -hmm. um, and that idea of like, we are tossing, like we're handing off that baton we're saying like, you are capable of doing this. You are enough. And we're here to empower you. And you have that power within yourself. And like, you don't need anybody to tell you that you can or cannot do something. You are capable and you can. You're enough and feel as powerful as we do right now in this moment. Yeah, if there is one word that I could take away from the feeling I get at the end of the show and would wanna to transfer to anyone watching the show, it's connected. I feel so powerfully connected to everybody on the stage at the end of the theatrical version and to everybody at the audience. Um, and I think about the fact that every single person on earth is out here trying to write our story on the stars and in stone and just carve it and make it last and make it beautiful. And that's, that's great. That's what we're all here to do. But what we can, Sometimes when we feel like we're not making our mark or we're not carving it deep enough, um, we can feel like we're in competition to one another. But instead we can look at it as we are all working towards the exact same goal. We all are connected to one each other, to one another, and we're all on the same side. So that, that's just the that's a very powerful feeling that I get from the music at the end of the show. And I, I hope everybody was able to take that home with them today. I will do a quick tag on Melissa if I can, because I did want to point out something that um, the stewards of the show before us, um, Kalia Davis, Nina Meehan, obviously, of course, Adam and, and Deborah, everyone who was part of the creation of this, I think, matters. And I just want to, to mention that when you watch the finale, you don't see time. Uh, Heather Sawyer, who plays Time and Miss Chan, the hero that shows up at the end, along with Flo aside Flojo and Sally and Ruby Bridges and uh, Justice Sotomayor, is Miss Chan, is this fourth grade teacher. And um, that almost got me to cry. <laughs> Just, as I said, that almost brought a tear to my eye. I find that so moving that, and that came to us in the show, but that was not a decision we made, but it was a decision that I was so proud to carry on in terms of the legacy of She Persisted, the musical that Miss um, Chan stands with these women, that this fourth grade teacher stands in the flanks, like with sat among Sally Ride and a fourth grader who's found her voice and uh, believes in herself, has sort of restored her sense of of um, of self, of of herself and confidence in herself. So, I uh, that was just inspired by what Cynthia and what everyone had said, but especially what Cynthia said that we really are um, at our strongest together. Um, and that these women don't even show up for Naomi as miraculous, you know, as these, these dominant, you know, like I'm the most incredible woman. They come, they show up to help her. They, they show up to, to bring her into the fold, to make her a part of the legacy, to like weave her into the fabric. And uh, so I just wanted to point that out. If anyone watching noticed that detail that no, it is not, not 
magical time. It's Miss Chan who is the hero in line with the women at the end. And Melissa, I know that we're like well over time, but I just, I want to say one thing, if it's okay, quickly, uh, building on what MK said, and I, I just got to have to give a shout out to Mrs. Porter, who was my fourth grade teacher and an amazing teacher, and to all the teachers who might be watching us. Um, I think we're living through a moment uh, that clearly shows us that the stories that we tell about ourselves, the stories that we value, and the stories that we tell our children, they are either a part of or not and whether they have agency to continue to author the next chapter um, is really pretty painfully clear. And I just want to thank everyone um, you know, on, on this Zoom screen to here, but everyone really at the Atlantic uh, and who has um, made it a priority, not only with She Persisted, but uh, other stories um, that value little girls and that value women um, and, and are enabling us to kind of write ourselves kind of into our American story with, with dignity and purpose and centrality. Uh, I think it really, really matters. Uh, and I think we're seeing why it really matters uh, right now in this moment in time. And I just am really proud to even be a very small part of this uh, with, with all of you. And I'm super grateful to the Atlantic. So thank you. On that note, um that that's I think we'll we'll end it there on our talk back um that was so inspiring I'm also feeling very emotional uh, about all of this um and just thank you to Chelsea and to MK and the whole cast um for sharing your time and thank you to our audience for sticking with us I know we're a little bit over 